Okay, the basic success stories occur right in our own backyard. This panel will explain their economic development strategies to grow their entities and create more jobs. You can learn insights on how to utilize strong partnerships with state and federal agencies and their programs. You'll also be hearing about their efforts and vision for the future for continued growth and service to the area. I want to introduce the moderator for this session. Uh, she's been a great supporter of, uh, of this conference. Thanks to her generosity and State Bank Financial, you got the bags that came with the presentation packets. She's also donated pens. Uh, she's got a booth here. Uh, she's very active with the committee. Also a former Chamber of Commerce president here in Sparta. And uh, it's great to have her be part of today's event. So the moderator for this session, please welcome Carol Oster. Then we have Mary Freiber, the Executive Director from Saving Love Community Health Centers. Then we have Mark Rhoda Reed. He's a Marketing Development Manager, the American Americas and Europe um, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. And then we have um, Julie Lassa. She's our 24th District Senate Representative. And then we have Derek Bernstead from Burnstead European Restaurant and Market. And they're here to talk about our backyard. So we will start with uh, Colonel Stephen Knott. Well, good morning. Um, I'm going to try to uh, speak through this a little quicker than I intended, but I want to try to get us back on track a little bit. But more importantly, my intent isn't to short shrift any of my information it's to create a little more time at the end for q a which i would argue is probably the more important anyway so if you see me skipping through some of these i apologize but that's uh, that's why i'm doing it next all right first off uh, <laughs> i do want to talk uh, that uh, fort mccoy sometimes has just being a military installation behind fences it's all scary and secret and everything uh, sometimes there's misperceptions and i just want to be very very clear that fort mccoy is in itself its own community it has its own residents, it has its own services that needs to be provided, and it has its own challenges that have to be met just like any other municipality. And of course, we are part of Monroe County and we have a great impact on the entire region. Now the mission, back up one, with the mission statement, um, most of that is focused on what we do at, on our Army mission. Um, and of course, that impacts the, the uh, economy as well. But the two I have highlighted in red are more direct interaction with the communities here. Uh, the community covenants, many of you have signed that, uh, basically recognizes that the business and uh, civilian leadership of the area are crucial to our success as well. Uh, the last piece is the defense support of civil authorities. Fort McCoy is a designated base support installation, it's BSI. And what that means is if there is a major emergency in this region that requires a national response, Fort McCoy is pre-designated to support the responders. Now again, Fort McCoy isn't the responder. I will have a base ops requirement to support the uh, Department of Defense, uh, FEMA, whatever type of national uh, responders are going to become rolling in to help that uh, type of a natural or man-made disaster. Uh, in order to, to provide the, the aid and comfort you would need at that time. So we have a crucial role in that too. Next, this one's a big one. The economic impact, this is the dollars, gets us right down to the crux of the matter. Uh, we are the largest employer in Monroe County. There's over 2,800 people approximately who roll through the gates every day to report to work on Fort McCoy. Now, not all of them are mine. There are about 46 different tenant organizations that reside inside the post. Fort McCoy's garrison accounts for about half of that population. The other half is both state, federal, and also private industry that happens to be inside the fence line. And when you take a look at these uh, numbers, that rolls up to about just over a $1 billion economic impact on Monroe County and the surrounding region. Um, I also want to uh, highlight that this is a fairly conservative estimate. What it does not capture is it does not capture the impacts on tourism, for instance. This is right now, Secretary Klett's area, all right? 
we have our own ski hill. We're actually one of only three Army installations globally that has their own ski hill. One is in Alaska and the other one's at West Point. And that's open to the public and yes, that brings tourism into the area. Our campground is also open to the public and that is one of the most popular campgrounds in the state of Wisconsin. It is a uh, very high demand and is quite frequently completely maxed out on occupancy. And then of course we also have the concert here at Fort McCoy too. That's part of what's called an Army Entertainment Concert Series. And guess what installation in the entire Army has the largest grossing concert series? It is Fort McCoy. It is not Fort Hood. It's not Fort Bragg. It's us. All right? And that brings tourism into the area as well. It also does not capture the training population. So we, this is a very conservative estimate. Next. I'm not going to go into a lot on this. My main intent of this slide as you read through it is to show that Fort McCoy isn't great because the employees there say it is. Fort McCoy is a recognized installation at the Department of the Army and Department of Defense level. All of these awards were achieved last year alone, with the exception of the one in red, and I'll cover that very briefly. That Fire Department International Accreditation, we're only the fourth Army installation to have that. There's fewer than 300 municipalities in the United States that have achieved that accreditation. All right, so we have great folks there. That recent announcement just last week is that we are only the fifth Army installation to achieve Joint National Training Center certificate or Joint National Training Certification. And what that does for us is it puts us in all the training databases of every single service. So when Navy, Marines, Air Force are looking to train somewhere, Fort McCoy will pop up as being pre-certified and capable of meeting their own doctrinal training requirements. Big deal. Next. Main purpose of this slide is I've been, uh, I guess I've briefed this a lot throughout the community, some of you have seen it already, is to show the impact of mobilization is actually the opposite of what a lot of folks in the community think. The flavor of our customer has changed, but we're actually busier without mobilization. You see that reverse bell curve? That's the MOB years. There's a lot of reasons why that happens. The big two are, if you have a MOB mission, it's your number one purpose in life. That's your most important mission you have. These soldiers are going into harm's way, therefore they get priority in all the resources, and other people get bumped. So they start looking elsewhere to train. The really big reason why it happens is where are all our customers when we have a mobile mission? Why do we have a mobile mission? Which ended in October a year and a half ago. You have a mobile mission because you're at war. It's a temporary mission, thank God. No one wants to be in perpetual conflict. But your customers are fighting. They're overseas. And they're coming back right now. Okay. Thank you. So our customers are coming home. Your customers are not at home during the, uh, no. no, still not? It's got a green light. There you go, you got it. All right, right now. Try holding it closer. Since our customers are not at home, they can't train during the mobilization years, but now they're coming home, they're coming back. All right, next. External support is where you come in. We rely on uh, communities and elective, uh, elected officials to make us relevant. We can't provide that exceptional customer service without you. Our internal factors, we are also leaders on. I can't take credit for that. A lot of staff has worked very hard over the decades in order to make Fort McCoy a strategic planner that is recognized with Installation Management Command as a best practice. That's globally on all Army installations. We have best practice strategic planning. So all those awards and recognitions, they don't happen by mistake. Next. You can read these. The bottom line is uh, all of these strategic objectives get broken down into over 400 different tasks that are tracked. I get reported on them quarterly, and each one of those tasks are further broken into thousands of individual goals that appear on individual employees' performance objectives that they're rated on on their ability to do their job. So every single employee that's working on Fort McCoy, I can promise you their performance objectives individually support that strategic objective. One of these somewhere or more, all right? So the message out of all of this 
is Fort McCoy is a good steward of your taxpayer dollars. We're doing what we're supposed to to make sure that we're efficient and effective. Next, I'm only going to hit three of these. So all of this helps us to be uh, uh, relevant. That search capacity is almost unheard of. That top bullet, when you combine that with the Ford operating bases, which have climate controlled tent living, if you will, but they're heated, they're air conditioned, there's feeding uh, units that are out there that are actually uh, semi-permanent buildings. We have a 12,250 bed capacity that I can search to on a moment's notice. And that's why if we go into a major conflict again, we'll have a mode mission again. All right. Next one is the CAC TIF is coming online. That's that combined arms collective training facility, third bullet or fourth bullet from the bottom. That was a 25-ish million dollar project that is just coming online. And uh, that is going to be bringing customers in from all services to include interagencies, and they're already lining up and scheduling that now. Lastly, I want to talk about the range throughput. 8,700 soldiers a day is just the ranges. Also, very few in the Army can claim that kind of throughput. We can actually accommodate up to 20,000 soldiers on any given day on Fort uh, McCoy. In our highest surge last week, uh, last year, we had a week where we had 13,800 soldiers at one time on Fort McCoy. Next. All right. Now we're going to start talking uh, as we build up to our challenges. The five-year defense plan, we call it the FIDEP, is basically the Army-approved military construction. Now, I need to be very careful with this when I caveat it. This is on the Army plan. It is not necessarily budgeted. Normally, if you make it onto the FIDEP, you're looking pretty good. But we're not in normal times right now, all right? Of course, the key thing is if you don't get approved on the Army plan, you don't even go before Congress for funding. So in FY13, I have three new construction projects at $26 million in value scheduled to come on to Fort McCoy. One of them is fully funded at this point. The other two are looking good, but I'll talk sequestration later, all right? FY14, 47.4, and then 16.8 and 18. And again, none of those budgets, Congress won't even approach those until October 1st of uh, this coming year, all right? Next. This one's very near and dear to my heart, and it's part of the FY14 and 18 construction uh, dollars you saw on the previous slide. What you're looking at is the development plan for my South Post housing area. There are currently 57 homes on South Post, which a uh, very strange entity. It's on Fort McCoy property. It's uh, within the Angelo confines as far as voting demographics and I think census rating. And then uh, it has a Sparta post, uh, post office zip code. So we got a little mix of everything there. But this is family housing. If you don't have a family, you don't live there. There's over 120 children in that, in that location right now with 57 homes. If these projects go forward, look at 14. I'm going to double my size. And that means students coming into the Spartac School District as well. But it also means more families coming in who are going to be looking for entertainment in the local community. All right. Next. Uh, this is supposed to show you that I have a zoning and uh, master planning capability next. <laughs> All right. This is, well, it's important, but uh, there's things I think we need to talk about that are more important right now, and this is the first one. I got two major challenges looming here for Fort McCoy. Obviously, sequestration affects the entire Department of Defense as well as several other federal agencies. DOD is paying the biggest bill. Half that sequestration bill falls on the Department of Defense. Fort McCoy is part of that. This uh, slide is part of a Department of the Army release that came out a few days ago, and it's actually very, very good to get a general overview discussion on impact by state and country. It is less useful when you break down to local communities. I can tell you already, Fort McCoy's number, I can't really go into specific figures because honestly, that, that final uh, fallout hasn't even happened yet, but I assure you it's bigger than that, okay? The word, the, I'm gonna go right down to the bottom in that red where it says Monroe County Economic Impact? <coughs> question mark. A lot of uncertainty. I don't know what the economic impact will be on Fort Monroe County 
or excuse me, on Monroe County. But I guarantee you, you will have one. I have 1,500 employees who are right now going through uh, a lot of stress because the Department of Defense is getting ready to implement a furlough plan if sequestration is not avoided here within the next, what, 16 hours or something like that. All right. um, what it means for the family, it's not quite accurate, but uh, this is the actual impact on the family if you're one of those 1,500 is a 20% pay cut. Now, if any of you out in that audience were to take a 20% pay cut, what's the first thing that you're going to curtail? Discretionary spending, right? So, yeah, the community is going to feel it. It also might come down on those contracts I mentioned. Right now they're in the Army approved plan, but if the money starts getting curtailed because of sequestration, there will be construction projects on that five-year defense plan that will get eliminated. Will any of them be Fort McCoy? I don't know. All right. Next. This is the next big challenge that I suspect is coming. Now I need to be very clear on this one. Colonel Nott is not telling you that there is a BRAC coming in 2014 or 2015. Not my job to do that. What happens is the service secretaries will recommend or not, and when that happens, it's a congressional action. This is law, all right? So nobody's talking it right now. What this slide is showing, though, is the years it's happened, and there's a cycle to it. And I would be remiss if, if, of, to be Commander of Fort McCoy and ignore that cycle. So. There, I, well, I can assure you one thing, there will be another BRAC, whether it's in 2014, 15, or 2050, I don't know, but there will be one, all right? So, so what, right? It affects me. You all have a voice. You've seen the economic data. You've seen that we have an impact on each other. And uh, as this happens, I will do my planning, but uh, just remember, you all have a voice. Next. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. Next, we have Mary Freiberg, who is the Executive Director for Seated Co-op's Community Health Centers in Cashton. Mary has been the Executive Director for Seated Co-op's Community Health Centers with sites in Cashton and Norwalk since 2003. Prior to joining Seated Co-op's, Mary worked in government affairs with advocacy for the Wisconsin Primary Health Care Association in Madison for eight years. She has worked as a legislature staff member for six years in both the State Assembly and the State Senate. So we welcome Mary Freiberg from Cashton City Bluffs. It's a little tight up here. Um, hi, we're going from a $1 billion economic impact to a $5 million economic impact. So the size of the organizations up here are very different. Um, we employ um, about 75 people. Um, and last year we saw about 8,000 patients came through the door. So 8,000 people walked through the, a day walked through Fort McCoy and 8,000 people walked through in a year for us. And so uh, very different sizes. Um, but Scenic Bluffs Community Health Center is a primary care clinic. And we provide um, services for people in the areas of medical, dental, pharmacy, chiropractic, and behavioral health care. Um, we have contracts with other organizations. We just signed a contract with the VA to help with some mental health services. Um, but what we also do is provide services for people, anyone in the area, um, but we also sort of specialize in services for people who are lower income. And so for us, about 6,000 of our, of our 7,900 patients live below the federal poverty level. And so that's a, that's a big number. It's a product of where we live. There's a lot of people in this area who are low income. And so we're very proud to be able to provide services for those folks. Um, a community health center is, is different than other healthcare organizations that you'll see. We um, receive a federal grant um, and in the last 20 years have gotten about $20 million in a direct federal investment in primary care services for Monroe County. We've also um, pull in in the last 13 years, two and a half million dollars in state funding for primary care services as well. And so for all of you who have employees who are working in entry level jobs, may not have health insurance, there are options in the area. 
This county is rich in health care resources. The Mayo Franciscan system is dynamite. The hospital here in Sparta is wonderful. The hospital in Toma is great. We have a very strong public health department. And so all of us try and work together. Um, we often joke that, that there's um, a coalition in Monroe County for everything on, on health or human services related issues. And so what we try and do is not duplicate efforts and we all try and work together. We all have special niches that we fill. Um, but I think the purpose of my conversation today is to, first of all, give you a brief overview of what the health center is, but then talk about some of the community investment um, activities that we've done specifically in Cashton and, and Norwalk. And um, the partnerships that we develop, all of us um, are that re need to work together. None of us can do things on our own. And so one of the things that we've learned in Cashton pretty quickly is that if you want to get something done, you have to find your other partners. And so the health center partners with the school district, with the village of Cashton, with the bank of Cashton, um, and we all um, have worked together on some community economic development initiatives. Um, I was really excited by the Connect Communities grant that Cashton received. I think that's gonna be wonderful for the community. Um, and that was a product of a group of people coming together, starting to talk about it, and then someone who actually wrote the grant. And so um, I think that that's a really important thing to try and remember. Um, there's, a, there's a saying that says uh, you can't, what is it, you can't dance if you're not on the dance floor. And so one of the things that you have to remember is that you have to put yourself out there and stay involved in things. Things that may not naturally come, um, you may not think of a healthcare organization as caring about housing stock, but we do. We employ people, we want them to come and live in our community. Um, and so what we need are good, solid housing options for people who choose to live there. We have a strong interest in broadband connections. Um, it's very difficult to operate an electronic health record in a rural community when your upload speeds are way slow. And so what you want to do is to make sure that you look at the healthcare organizations in your area as strong partners in all of the economic development things that you do because while we, while we do provide services for for your employees, we also are businesses that um, hire people and train them and they purchase gas and they go to restaurants and they do all of the things that any other um, business does. And so what we need to do as healthcare is to work more closely with the economic development community because that's an important, um, that's an important partnership that we have to have. Um, I just wanted to talk to you just briefly a little bit about what we've done in Cashton with community health and wellness. And so people will look at healthcare organizations as, as groups that will, that will um, try and focus on maintaining a healthy community. Our mission is to do that. Um, but what we've done with the, um, a few years back, the school district was going to um, eliminate the school nurse position because for budgetary reasons. They weren't able to continue to employ that position because of the expense. I was contacted by the superintendent at the time and they said we're, we're close to probably eliminating this position. Is there anything that you can do to help? And we said yes, we can. Um, the, I took it to my board. Um, it's a board of community uh, users. Um, and so I said yes, we can help. We would be happy to employ the school nurse contract with you because we can employ the school nurse for less expensive than the school district was able to. That was six years ago. We've had that partnership since then. Um, but what we've also developed out of that is a shared uh, community physical activity promotions effort. We um, have a lot of, there's a cardio lab that the school has access to that no one else in the community had access to. We work together to open that up for community members. There's a lot of community classes now that happen. Um, there's, there's an initiative now to create a, um, a health and wellness strategic plan for Cashton. We're positioned to write a grant to the Wisconsin um, School of Medicine and Public Health um, to try and capture some significant dollars, up to $400,000, to help develop those sorts of things. And so what I'd like to leave you all with is, is the importance of understanding the impact that, that the healthcare services, people locate in communities for a number of reasons. Two of them are education and healthcare. If you have access to those things, that's why people would want to be there. And so. Um, in the village of Cashton, in the village of Norwalk, we're really proud to be able to do those services. And we'll continue to try and work with people, and I was excited by the turnout at this meeting. I think it's awesome. Um, and so I look forward to hearing from everybody else. Thanks.
Thank you. And also, just as a reminder, on your tables, there's a blue piece of paper that if you have any questions for any of the panelists, to please fill them out and we'll collect them throughout the, or towards the end of the program. So next, we have Mark Rhoda Rees. He's the Marketing Development Manager for Americas and Europe with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Mark brings to the Wisconsin Development Economic Development Corporation has with over 30 years of sales and marketing experience with more than 24 years in the global sales and business development. He has helped companies grow their international business in Latin America, the Middle East, Western Europe, Asia, Pacific, and Canada. The, his key industry experience is in technical industrial consumer products, fit, fitness equipment, and medical devices. We welcome Mark. Good morning, thank you. I appreciate uh, Monroe County Economic Development and the ITBEC folks for uh, hosting this event so that we're able to um, speak with you about what we do and what we can do for you. Are you able to hear way back in the back? Are you able to see it? Great. Uh, thanks to Jenny um, Guterer for uh, doing all the hard work. So she explained all the really difficult stuff so I can just do, do the easy things about the international business. Also with us today is uh, Danielle D uh, Danny Jones uh, from our business and industry sector. So if you've got questions later on about things we've talked about, uh, the three of us are around to be able to, to follow up on that. What I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about um, what we have available for international business in the state. But to begin with, could I get a show of hands of the folks who are uh, businesses, companies, manufacturers, agricultural um, uh, uh, groups that are, that are in, the, in the room here? Okay, so it's a fair number, and then um, the majority of you then would be in, uh, working with economic development. And it's great to be able to speak to both, both groups, both the manufacturers, the businesses, and economic development. Um, and in a discussion about strategies for economic development in your own backyard, well, one of the things to think about when you're standing in your own backyard is thinking about uh, where else you should go in the world. Uh, Wisconsin um, has $23 billion in exports in 2012. We're up a billion dollars from the previous year, 4.7%, a little bit better than the na national average. Agricultural products up about 3% or 2.9 billion, so about uh, 12 and a half, almost 13% of the uh, total export of uh, products out of Wisconsin are agricultural products. So we're, we're quite a large um, exporting state. We're about 18th in the nation uh, for all over exports, about 13th in the nation for uh, agriculture. International business is important to companies. Um, just some facts about export. 20% uh, of our um, manufacturers are exporting. 36% of our mining, manufacturing, and farm uh, GDP comes from exports. If you're a company and you're exporting, you're involved in international business, you're growing at 2.4 times um, the rate, and um, you are uh, growing your employment about four times um, uh, the rate of what non-exporting companies do. So it's, it's an important strategy that uh, you should consider for your business. There are 6,500 current exporters in the state. Um, but the potential number of exporters is more like 14,000. So if we did 23 billion with, with 6,500, imagine what we could do if we could even get 10 or 15% more of those companies doing export business. The impact would be huge. We'd like to talk about is what uh, we're able to do uh, as a uh, private public authority now, um, as an agency to uh, support your efforts in growing international business. Um, basically, it breaks down to this, uh, know-how, funding, and in-market um, services. And I like to say it this way, it's brains, it's bucks, and it's being there. And in fact, that's the really short version of the speech, you know, when you go on the web and you, and you have those words, you click through to all the rest of the information. If you just have those three words, brain, well, being there is a little bit more, brains, bucks, being there, and then the 14 magic letters that will get you there, in Wisconsin.com. That's the entire talk. Let me give you a little, a little bit more detail, though, while we have some time. Um, so first of all, the brains. Market development directors, there are three of us. We've broken the planet up. I have Americas in Europe. I've got two colleagues that handle um, 
Asia Pacific uh, and uh, India, Middle East, Africa. Uh, as well, at the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection, DATCAP for short, D-A-T-C-P, they've also got uh, four folks, uh, three folks, excuse me, who are uh, focused on uh, international business development, uh, either in processed foods, as well as uh, uh, lumber products and uh, other um, farm-related uh, livestock genetics, for example, and they're covering various parts of the world, mostly into Asia Pacific, uh, Europe, and Latin America. Um, as well, we have a foreign direct investment manager, a gentleman who is helping to attract businesses into the state from overseas who are interested in, in uh, growing their business in the U.S., also important for international development. Um, as well, we have a, a export development manager, uh, Brad Schneider, the, the foreign direct inv investment person, is, uh, his name is uh, uh, Scott Mosley. Uh, Brad Schneider is working with new to export companies, but also helping with one of our uh, training one of our know-how programs called uh, Export Tech. I'll speak about that in just a second. Also working with us, uh, besides DATCAP, um, on the federal side, the U.S. Commercial Service, they have an office in Milwaukee. They're helping to support. There are federal dollars associated with what they're doing. Uh, the Foreign Agricultural Service, they have offices overseas that help um, specifically agriculture and food companies. Uh, also the Small Business Administration, SBA. And we work with them. In fact, we're uh, administering one of their funding grants called STEP Grant. We'll talk about that in a second under the bucks. So these brains, um, both ours, but of course leveraging a lot of other people's information, know-how, knowledge, capability. Um, as well, um, there's a program that we're uh, working with the Manuf Wisconsin Manufacturers Extension Partnership, WMEP. You know, one of the things about this job is they, they clearly said in the description, must work well with the alphabet. I understand why now, because everything, not, not nearly as much as the military, I'm noticing, but, uh, but still, uh, a lot of letter groups, again, in wisconsin.com will get you to the, all the information. That um, grant, or that Export Tech program is an international business development plan process. What that will do is take a company who either is an experienced exporter or someone who is completely new to export, and help you select a market, understand the, the needs that you need to have in your organization to prepare yourself for that and your products, to do some of the technical training around uh, how to uh, organize yourself, how to do the documentation work, how to make sure you're compliant, as well trade financing side of, of the equation, how to get paid for your uh, exporting work. You do three one-day sessions over three months you spend about $2,500. The tuition is $5,000, which is supported by this uh, SBA uh, funding through our organization, WEDC. So three full days, $2,500. The companies who are doing that program within 12 months of completing the program are booking between six hundred dollars and $900,000 in revenue. I don't know how many times or how many opportunities you have to spend that little time and that little money to make that much in revenue. So an important program, we'd like to talk, and all the uh, economic development folks uh, who are in the room, please, as you hear this, as you think about it, think about the companies who are in your area who could benefit, who should be benefiting from this. We'd like to talk to them. We'd like to set up an opportunity to, to speak with them some more. So let's talk a bit more about the bucks. Export Tech is supported by uh, that grant funding that I mentioned. Also, we have an international market access grant, again with the letters I-M-A-G, I-M-A-G, uh, that grant, $10,000 per company per year. Helps to go to trade shows, helps to localize your marketing materials, helps to register your products. There are a number of things that we do. It used to be uh, capped at a $25 million company. Now it's, it's uh, quite, um, quite a bit more open in terms of um, who's available to uh, qualify for that grant. Must be a Wisconsin company, must have over 50% Wisconsin content. Uh, in your product, but that includes not just cost of goods, also other uh, economic input. Again, talk to us, please. Economic Development Grant, it's a training um, opportunity, $3,000 per year per company to train people on your staff, export compliance, uh, international negotiation, a number of things from accredited uh, associations or groups who are um, focused on international business. And a lot of the technical colleges, a lot of the folks in the area, the SBDCs, the um, small business development centers that are uh, attached with the universities, they can provide some <coughs> of these things. 
Uh, I mentioned the SBA loan, STEP, State Trade Export Partnership Grant, STEP grant. Uh, besides that export tech, it's also helping to support trade ventures, that's visits to markets uh, with companies to meet with potential customers and uh, supporting uh, upwards of can be half of the vo uh, value of that uh, uh, trade um, venture <laughs> that you're doing. And then food export, uh, that's a federal grant run through the uh, a program, run through the uh, Department of Agriculture, DATCAP. Um, there are funds available for specifically for food product, uh, agricultural product companies. The being there. So I mentioned the trade ventures. Um, we are uh, just cl we've closed out. There's a group going to uh, South Africa uh, the first part of March. There is the governor um, and a group of companies that uh, there's still some openings for that if people are interested. Uh, they're going to China from the uh, 12th to the 21st of April. Um, in May from the 6th to 11th, we're going to Australia and then South America, and that's that's my group. In September, we'll be going to uh, Colombia, Chile, and Brazil. Again, businesses meeting with other businesses in order to um, understand, in order to um, be able to find partners to sell your products. What we have available for you as part of your international business strategy are the brains, the bucks, and the being there to help you become part of the 14,000 companies that should be exporting in this state, and hopefully within a short time will be. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Julie Lassa, who is our 24th District's um, Senate representative. Well, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I used to be the executive director for a small chamber. It was the Flowberry Business Association. And in the state senate, I now serve uh, on the Economic Development Committee, Financial Institutions Committee, as well as the Agriculture, Tourism, and Small Business Committee. And then my other responsibility is I'm also on the board of directors for the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. And as you know, uh, and you just heard from um, Mark's discussion, that at WEDC, our exports are a real bright spot uh, for what's happening in our state's economy. And it's something that we should really be proud of in terms of everyone, uh, businesses in this state, and WEDC's <coughs> efforts uh, to really build on our export capacity. Now, um, as someone who is really interested and passionate about economic development and how we can really help create good paying family supporting jobs in the state of Wisconsin. I believe that we really need to be focusing in, uh, in this state on creating and growing our own businesses. Helping entrepreneurs and small business owners to be able to grow and expand in our state. The Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance just recently noted uh, unfortunately, that Wisconsin, one of the reasons why we're lagging in job creation performance is due in part to the lack of new business startups. And I know Governor Walker and both parties in the legislature and both houses recognize that we need to be able to do more. Uh, it's one of the areas that we really agree on in the legislature. And uh, the Kauffman Foundation actually found that between 1992 and 2006, the newer, uh, when a newer firm was created, the more jobs it created. Firms in the first year of their existence actually created six times as many jobs as firms that were five years old or more. So uh, the Kauffman uh, Foundation also says that Wisconsin uh, has lagged behind the rest of the nation in new company formation. In fact, Wisconsin is 39th uh, in that rank. So I believe that in order for us to be able to help grow Wisconsin's economy, to be able to help create good paying family supporting jobs, we need to do what we can to really help entrepreneurs achieve the dream of starting their own small business, as well as helping small business owners take their business to the next level. And there's a number of ways that we can do that. First of all, um, for uh, business accelerators and uh, Governor Walker, has recognized that 
one of the bright spots and uh, something that is uh, relatively new is uh, the approach that vet transfer and uh, 94 labs has taken down in the Milwaukee area. Vet transfer uh, focuses on helping veterans who are returning uh, from service create a small business to become entrepreneurs. They have been so successful there. I uh, actually have received grants from the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and instead of, as some of you who, who know, uh, some people can get stuck on business plans and redoing their plans for years. What Vet Transfer has done in their um, uh, business formation strategy is to go to lean startup. And it's a new way to just cut through all of that to help that, that entrepreneur, that veteran, focus in on their specific niche, their idea for creating a business, be able to mentor them, uh, as well as give them a place to operate and, uh, and do their startup. It's been very successful. Governor Walker actually has mentioned that in uh, his budget plan, and I believe that it really does serve as an example for what we should be doing in the rest of the state in terms of helping to nurture entrepreneurs by giving them uh, mentorship opportunities and not just space and access to uh, technology. One of the other things that uh, we've been hearing from small businesses is that they like the tax credit programs, but until you get uh, income coming in and you have a tax liability, those tax credits aren't really going to be doing you very much good. So we have a proposal out there that would allow WEDC to turn the tax credits that a business would qualify for into a grant. So that way we can get direct infusion of that early money that's so necessary for entrepreneurs and small businesses uh, to take it to the next level. And that way, in order to make sure that there's no double dipping, they'd be able to get the grant but then could not apply for that tax credit uh, later on. There's also, um, we need to be doing more in terms of promoting micro lending programs, uh, such as the uh, Community Development uh, Finance Institution, and making it easier for uh, those to help out distressed rural areas and urban areas with job creation. Uh, I am getting the signal from Sharon to wrap it up. Uh, so I'm going to do that, and I look forward to speaking to more of you during the of a new location. Involved with the Toma Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, First United Methodist Church Finance Committee, and the Viterbo University Alumni Board. We welcome Derek Bernstead. Well, according to my clock, I do have about 30 seconds, so I'll try to <laughs> hold part to, and move this along as fast as I can, but thanks for having me. What an honor to be here. And, uh, uh, the privilege to speak about you know the heritage of my family and the company and how it's evolved over the since 1944. So uh, we'll be celebrating our 69th anniversary in October of this year, and uh, to be a fourth generation owner operator, it's a it's a I guess to say it's a blessing is probably an understatement. So uh, it's neat to to be in the situation I'm in, and, and at the same time a little little pressure involved with that, but. Uh, like I said, fourth generation owner operator, been around since 1944. Our company did start in uh, Toma, south side of Toma, and uh, it's kind of evolved over the course of, like I said, 69 years. Um, when, when I started in the business, um, it, it was a totally different animal, and I've, I've seen a lot of changes just just within the last nine years. And and you know, change is good. Somebody already told me, or once told me, that change is fresh, and uh, you continue to better yourself with change. 
But uh, you know, a lot of ups and downs, and, and once again, that's what makes makes you and your company and your people and your associates better. Um, we, we have four uh, traditional grocery stores located in four separate counties, Monroe County, of course, Jackson County, Marathon County, and Richland County. We got a, a full-scale restaurant, a floral department, and a village boutique in Toma as well. So kind of a jack of all trades. We're 350 associates strong. Uh, we added 50 new uh, positions this year alone within the last 12 months, was, which was uh, definitely a milestone and uh, an honor to take part in. Anytime you can add a position or two, um, let alone 50, is a pretty unique uh, uh, obstacle to overcome. Uh, we're independently owned. That, that's probably the biggest, uh, I think, benefit we have. We compete against the world, not the nation's, the world's largest retailer in all four of our communities, uh, also known as Walmart. And um, um, we, we found our niches. And I'll, I'll be explaining those real briefly uh, because of the time situation here, but um, it, it's it's about being involved in the communities. That that's been a it's been a, a cornerstone of mine since I started uh, first with the company. Uh, not only to promote our mission statement seven days a week, we start all all of our meetings off by reciting the mission statement. We start all meetings off followed by the mission statement by giving out our Papa Bernie Award, and that's that's community award given by the store director or the store leader. We're always promoting mission and then community. Those are two things that we can run with as independently owned uh, operators that um, you know maybe our competition can or cannot, I guess. So um, uh, real quick, I wanna give you a timeline. Uh, and you're gonna be, I'm gonna use a 2009, uh, that year as a focal point. In 2008, I'll back up a year, the stock market took a crash. As we all know, a uh, very challenging year, very scary year for many of us. In uh, 2009, uh, my father and I wrote a business plan, and the business plan was a very aggressive business plan. Uh, we didn't know if it was, you know, if, if it was realistic, but you never know if, if it can or cannot be achieved. So in 2009, we remodeled our Toma facility, a multi-million dollar um, a remodel. In 2010, our Richland Center facility, $300,000 investment and remodel. Black River Falls was in 2011, $400,000 remodel. And uh, in 2012, last April, we purchased our fourth location up in Spencer, Wisconsin, and stuck uh, $300,000 into that. Over the course since 2009, we've stuck five and a half million dollars, five and a half million dollars back in our four markets. Invested back in our people, invested back w w with our communities. So um, with, with that being said, um, I'm gonna list up real quick and then I'll, then I'll uh, shut this off your uh, business principles for a company like I said we believe in three things three things that are near and dear above and beyond even our mission and that's always at all times respecting our employees respecting our vendors that deal with us and work with us and once again in being involved in our communities those business principles Burnstead's market business principles are who we are what we stand for and what we do and once again that independent culture family-owned culture we can make decisions on the spot. We don't need corporate approval. Uh, once again, we use that in our best interest and in our benefit to go to market. So um, how's that for a real five minute wrap? <laughs> Thank you.